Paul writes. We're in Acts chapter 15, continuing in verse 36, where we, uh, where we left off last week. Paul and Barnabas had, uh, had again come back from the Council of Jerusalem. Uh, we got introduced to uh, Silas at that time, who, of course, becomes a major player uh, from uh, here on out. And, uh, and if the decision had gone the other way, the evangelism uh, to Gentiles would have ended uh, at that juncture, but it didn't. Uh, through uh, the wisdom that God gave James uh, in the letter that was written. Uh, there was just a couple of concessions uh, that needed to be made uh, and a couple of requests there. And, uh, and so now Paul and Barnabas are going to uh, be ready to set out on their uh, uh, second missionary journey together. Uh, that They are going to fall into uh, what the text says, sharp uh, dispute. And, uh, you know, you could just read through this text and not really get a, a real sense of what's going on with these uh, these two men. I uh, I was actually looking uh, on YouTube for like a, a little video illustration of uh, of their conversation uh, because there's actually uh, several uh, and they all are between a, a major league baseball manager and an umpire. Uh, uh, and I was going to show you uh, one one of those because they all. They all go on too long, and because it's Major League Baseball, they all have commercials on them as well. But uh, uh, if you've ever seen one of those conversations where the, uh, uh, the umpire and the, uh, the manager go out in sharp dispute with one another, there's a lot of yelling and screaming, uh, dirt flying in the air. There's a protocol to it. The manager cannot touch the umpire, but he can get within inches of his face uh, and scream as loud as he possibly can. And... Um, uh, and uh, the uh, in in words that uh, that uh, in adjectives that uh, we won't use here in church, uh, he can kick dirt on his shoes, uh, but no further. Uh, and they they push it right to the limit of what they do. They know they're going to get kicked out, uh, and it's all for a, a a purpose to protest a call, uh, and it's on on behalf of his <coughs> team, so his players can know they never have to argue a, a call because they have a manager that will do that for them. But if you've ever seen one of those, it's, it's, it's interesting just to watch, because I don't care what coach it is, it always looks the same uh, when, when, they're, uh, when they're going, uh, going after it. The, um, that's what's happening with Paul and Barnabas over this decision of John Mark. We can read through this and think, oh, these two old friends they didn't quite get along, and that's okay. No, there, there's some screaming and shouting going on. And it wasn't just on one occasion, apparently. It was going on for a while. Uh, and all of this is, is the, the first of, of three circumstances where God is going to be directing the Apostle Paul in order to get the gospel into Europe. Would you say that was fairly important? That's, that's fairly important. It changed the course of history, what, what uh, we see uh, in this text. And it all begins with a, a huge argument between uh, two, uh, two old and very, uh, uh, very dear friends. What Pauline scholar Richard Longnecker says that, uh, quote, authentic turning points in history are few, but surely among them, that of the Macedonia vision ranks high. Again, the argument begins. Uh, it sets Paul with Silas on a journey they did not plan on going in a direction they did not plan on going. And it seems like when God is not leading them and not directing and not giving opportunities and things are not going well, well, actually, it's going really well from God's perspective uh, as they're going to get Paul to Troas where they're going to meet a man named Luke. And he's going to join them at that point. Paul gets a vision uh, to go across to what would be modern-day modern day Greece. Another writer said, uh, they were momentous days when Columbus set sail for Spain or when Vasco da Gama discovered the sea route to the West Indies, but those were of little significance compared to this great event. Uh, again, the gospel going to, uh, to, the, to the west uh, is huge. Let me just show you a couple of maps just kind of refresh us again. So to the far right, uh, by, you know, our right over here is Antioch. Uh, they, uh, they wanted to go to Cyprus. That's where they intended to go to, the little island. They were going to retrace their steps. Uh, they were going to cross uh, over then to what we'd say Perga or Pamphylia uh, and go up the elevation and visit the churches in Lystra, Iconian, uh, and Derby and so forth. But because of this dispute and breakup, you'll see that Paul goes overland, uh, and then he ends up, you'll see, going to Troas, once you go into the next, uh, the next map. So this whole kind of, you know, that, uh, 
lime green yellowish area in the middle along with Cappadocia. Uh, that's all uh, Turkey today, present Turkey. Uh, Thrace is, uh, is um, I want to say Bulgaria, but when you get over across a little Macedonian south, you'll see that it's Greece. You can find Athens on there, Corinth, and so forth. Uh, and you can see the route that they took. Now, again, we'll see in our text where it says Asia. And you think, I don't really think that's Asia. It was the name of a Roman province, so, uh, uh, or Asia Minor. And we'll see that the Holy Spirit prevented them from going there. They wanted to go there. The Holy Spirit didn't let them. They wanted to go north to Bithia. There were, that's the, uh, the Black Sea. There were some major cities up there. The Holy Spirit didn't allow them to do that either. It was like the Holy Spirit had them in a funnel and was directing them to get to uh, a certain point. So it's kind of the geography of it. But uh, uh, let's go back and, uh, and look at our text now and how that direction in this incredible, important thing that happens within Christianity and the history of the world begins uh, with a dispute over John Mark. So again, chapter 15, we're in verse 36, reading to verse 41. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. That's his intention, retrace, retrace the previous journey. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John, called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria, Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So the dispute comes uh, as Barnabas sought to include uh, John Mark, uh, once again. Uh, again, these two guys are, are cousins, uh, and, uh, and Barnabas certainly is more more the uh, the uh, uncle figure, being uh, much older than uh, than John Mark. John Mark's uh, may still be a, a, a t uh, you know a, a pretty young guy at this uh, uh, at this juncture. And uh, notice verse thirty seven again. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them uh, John Mark. Uh, the word determined. According to Weiss, means he kept on insisting. So it wasn't like he, hey, Paul, this is, I kind of got this thing. What, what do you think? We, we take John Mark with us. That, that's, it's not like a little suggestion. It's like a, a constant insisting that this is going to happen, uh, which, again, all of these things seem completely out of character as we kind of envision uh, in our minds these two great, uh, great apostles. And uh, I just said to tell you, there's a couple of things in this text that bring a lot of encouragement and a lot of comfort to me. And one of them is the fact that uh, these great men of God don't always get along. And, uh, and God still says, well, just get going anyway, and I'll still use it. I mean, it's, you know, God, God is being saying, I didn't cause this argument, but uh, I can work with this. <laughs> We're going to divide. We're going to have a couple of missionary terms here. Uh, Christians argue over things. Uh, Christians have disputes over things. Good and godly people, uh, and uh, uh, what what do we do with that that reality? Now, um, th that's actually the people in the first service. That's that's not you guys here. Right? <laughs> in general, in general, I'm I'm saying I'm, it would never happen to anyone here. I'm sure. But uh, again, uh, John Mark. Uh, remember, he was with them in the first missionary journey. They sail to Cyprus. Uh, they uh, they get there. They hoof it 90 miles to the uh, other side of the island. They have the encounter with. Eliamus, the, the sorcerer, uh, and uh, Paul, you know, casts a spell on him, basically makes him blind so he can get him to shut up long enough so he can preach the gospel. Uh, Sergius Paulus, the ruler, Roman ruler, he receives Christ, uh, his family, and so forth. Uh, they sail then across uh, north to, uh, uh, to uh, Pamphylia, uh, the Cliffs of Despair, uh, which, uh, again, is known for their uh, malaria and some other things. Paul is apparently sick because when he writes... Uh, the church of Galatia. He tells them that's why they got there. Uh, and so we could kind of speculate why John Mark left. He grows up in a very affluent home in Jerusalem. He's not acquainted with the, uh, the hardships of life or, or, or travel. Uh, and he's, uh, he's with Paul, which is a pretty hardcore guy. You know, I mean, Paul, you know, he's kind of saying, well, you, you, you might be a little sick there, Paul. Maybe we should turn back. Nah, we're just going to a higher elevation. How far is that? 100 miles, start walking, which is what they did, 3,000 feet up. Uh, and John Mark says that basically, 
uh, I'm, I'm out of here uh, at this point. Uh, again, verse 38, important the language there, Paul insisted they should not take with them the one who departed. And, and you kind of read that like, yeah, he left. That's not what Paul is saying. That's the term for desertion. Uh, it's the same term he uses in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy 4.10 of a guy named Demas who departed from the faith. This guy was with us, and he absolutely deserted us. Uh, so again, uh, this sharp dispute that they're having is uh, two guys yelling at the top of their lungs, probably on more than one occasion. A little dirt being thrown, Jewish guy, a little dirt being thrown uh, in the air as well. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's just kind of hard to imagine, but this is the reality uh, of what happened. Again, the, uh, the verse 39, sharp uh, disagreement. Uh, the, the Greek word there denotes a violent action, an emotion. Uh, I, I, I don't know if there was a little pushing going on here or, or not, but this is, this is Barnabas uh, and this, this is Paul. How hard was this for both of these guys? They both did this missionary journey together. Uh, Paul, kind of, I don't know where Paul would be without Barnabas. It's Barnabas that when nobody would talk to the guy because he was the persecutor of the church and then he gets saved, Barnabas is, Barnabas, Barnabas is the guy that comes to him, kind of introduces him to everybody and go, really, really, it's okay. And even then when, when, uh, when the, the church is all happening up there in Antioch and things are going on, it's Barnabas that goes and, uh, and finds uh, the Apostle Paul to bring him, bring him up there. And it's, and it's not like he was, uh, you know, uh, with the remote. You know, I mean, Paul, Paul was out doing ministry he, you know, as we went through that. Kind of had to hunt him down and find him. And say, hey, there's a great opportunity. Uh, this is his mentor. Uh, you know, there's this love, respect, uh, relationship with these guys, and then the, the things they've been through in that first missionary journey. Uh, and this is the guy that he's kind of having it out with now. This could not have been an easy thing. Ken Yu says that first missionary journey had produced a profound exchange of soul between these two men of God, sharing not only wounds, but vision. They were soul brothers. To be sure, they had disagreements and even occasionally disappointed one another. But never ever did they dream of being separated, except perhaps by death. Certainly the two missionaries did not expect what was about to happen. This is, this is a tough deal. Have you ever had a big, something major with somebody? And uh, man, it just, it affects you emotionally. Physically, it affects you. You know, just, uh, you know, going through things. And, uh, and that's what's going on with, with these guys. Verse 40, but Paul chose Silas, departed, being committed by the, uh, the brethren in the grace uh, of God. Uh, so apparently, Paul does leave with Silas. <laughs> we'll talk about his, uh, his uh, background a little bit. But um, uh, just a, a very hard, a very difficult situation. And we, we just note that it's Paul and Silas that are commended by the church. But, but not, not Barnabas and John Mark. Basically, uh, Barnabas sails to Cyprus and sails off the pages of Scripture uh, at, at this point. God still uses them. God still blesses them. Uh, John Mark turns out to be a pretty awesome young guy. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit at the end. G. Campbell Morgan, the great British preacher of a couple generations ago, said, I'm greatly comforted whenever I read this. If I had never read that Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas had a contention, I should have been afraid <laughs> because... We have contentions, you know, and uh, we sometimes uh, uh, put these, uh, these men and women uh, of the Bible in such a high pedestal. We, we think they're not like it. They're just human. They're, they're just like us. They're just folks that happen to be uh, filled with God's spirit, had a calling, had a direction, were obedient, and, uh, and went for it. Uh, and we're going to find uh, in this episode with Paul, he's not really even sure if God's leaving or not at, at some juncture. I know nobody, none of us have ever experienced that, but uh, uh, it's just good to know that uh, uh, these guys were human. They were real. One writer said, all Christians walk with limps. We rely upon the grace of our Lord, and both of these men would walk away limping, and both of them would be ever more dependent upon the grace of God. Because that's what happens when you have the, the big blowout with somebody that you love, respect, and spiritually, and at the end you go, it's just me and you, Jesus. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, sometimes that's all you got left. And, uh, and that's okay. Uh, and that's okay. And God's grace is sufficient. But uh, it's a huge dispute. Secondly, we just point out it's settled uh, by two different missionary teams. So Barnabas, he takes uh, Mark, sails to his, his native. He's from Cyprus. So uh, he returns there. 
Uh, we're not sure what uh, transpires with them after that. Uh, and of course, uh, Paul then goes overland, as we pointed out, with, uh, with Silas. Who was right? Um, question that's been uh, debated for probably 2,000 years. And uh, we just have to say it really doesn't matter. <laughs> It really doesn't matter. And probably uh, they were both right on some things and both wrong on, on some things as well. And we just know that good good and godly people in the church do uh, disagree at times. It's just part of the, uh, the facts of life. Uh, we would say uh, of Paul in his perspective, uh, he would look at people and say, what can they do for God's work? And he was always looking for the potential of people and, uh, and raising people up into ministry. What can they do for God's work? We might say that Barnabas was the kind of guy uh, that would say, what can God's work do for them? How can God's work impact them? You know, when we, um, we were meeting Friday night with the, uh, uh, the, the parents of the kids in the youth group talking about their fundraisers and all for their uh, a trip to uh, Japan uh, and uh, Okinawa uh, next summer. Uh, and one of the things that we're talking about, of course, is the things they will do uh, on the missions trip, the things they can do uh, for the kingdom of God and the gospel and so forth. But we're also talking about, parents are concerned about this, you'll understand, what will the trip do for them? Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, we're going for both reasons, uh, to do what we can do for the kingdom of God. But we also know uh, that those kinds of trips and those kinds of experience, not just for kids, but for adults, uh, can be life-changing because of what it does for them. Barnabas was the kind of guy that was, uh, I want to bring John Mark because he did fail last time. I admit, he did desert last time. I know. But I know, I know deep down inside, God's got a plan. God can use this kid. We just got to get him out there. We got to get him back on his feet. Don't you love to have a Barnabas in your, in your life? Somebody who just doesn't give up on you even when, you're, uh, when you failed and when you're down and out. But uh, uh, both godly men both disagree uh, for probably some, uh, some very good, uh, good reasons. So Silas ends up being, uh, being selected. Uh, he's, uh, again, a leader in the church in Jerusalem at the time. Uh, he's part of the Jerusalem conference of the last chapter. Uh, he's, uh, he's Greek, uh, but Jewish. Uh, uh, he, uh, he speaks Greek. Uh, his name is Silas, probably a Greek version of Saul. Uh, Peter will use his name as Silvanus, uh, and, uh, and apparently he becomes the, the secretary, the stenographer, the person who's able to write down uh, Peter's epistles uh, for him. Uh, he, uh, again, is a tremendous uh, uh, man of God. We, as it turns out, we, we could say that Silas could... Uh, uh, take a licking and keep on ticking, because we're going to see that in chapter 16. It's, it's an us when Paul and Silas are both beaten uh, and thrown into uh, a prison there in Philippi. And in chapter 16, verse 20, uh, 25, it says, About midnight, um, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Uh, so he's, he's quite, a, quite a partner to join the Apostle Paul uh, in, uh, in the ministry uh, here. Again, Paul, Barnabas departing, uh, he's losing someone that uh, obviously he owed, he owed a great to, a deal to, but uh, uh, John Mark and Barnabas sail away and off the pages of, uh, of Scripture. And, uh, but God uses and, uh, and uses these circumstances. Uh, that's our whole kind of big picture here, uh, is that we're thankful when God can direct us through His Word, which He does primarily, uh, he certainly can give us a piece about a situation or not. We're going to find out in this text. He can close doors and open other doors as we seek to be in God's will. Uh, and a lot of times, he just uses, uh, uses circumstances. You didn't get that job? I guess that wasn't God's will. <laughs> How do you know? You didn't get the job. You know, he just, he uses, he closes doors. He, uh, he opens uh, doors. We, have, we don't have to be discouraged. It doesn't mean God's ab abandoned us or, or, or something. Uh, it, it, it could even become because of a big argument. Well, God says, I'll, I'll still use that uh, uh, anyway. But again, Silas becomes just uh, an important player here uh, in the book of Acts uh, for us. Uh, John Mark, uh, again, seen as a failure by Paul, uh, but a guy named Barnabas is able to come by uh, and lift him up. Philip Brooks was a, a man that was a school teacher. Uh, that is, by, by his own admission, uh, he was a failure at it. 
He said, I didn't like my students and they didn't like me. I, I don't know, I think I've had, I might have had him in the sixth grade, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, I'm not quite old enough though. But uh, he said this when he got fired. He says, uh, I don't, do not know what will become of me and I don't care much. I, I wish I were 15 years old again. I believe I might become a stunning man, but somehow or other, I do not seem in the way to come to much now. You can tell by the language he, uh, he lived a, a while ago. Uh, he ends up becoming one of the greatest preachers in American history. And if you uh, end up visiting Boston someday and went to Holy Trinity, you'd see the statue of him uh, out front. There's lots of stories of people that were complete failures and then God used them in tremendous and powerful ways. John Mark is, is one of those guys. Again, we'll talk more about him uh, at the end, but uh, dispute over John Mark is one of the circumstances that helps get the gospel to Europe. The, the second involved a decision uh, with Timothy. That's uh, the first five verses of our next chapter, chapter 16. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and, be, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. Uh, he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, uh, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region. For they all knew that his father was uh, Greek. And they went through the cities. They delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in faith and increased in number daily. So the decision to have Timothy uh, join them. Again, uh, Paul uh, apparently leads to Timothy faith in Christ uh, on that first missionary journey. This is the city, remember, where Paul was stoned uh, and basically drug out the side of the city and left for death. And, uh, uh, and then the apostles or the other disciples, excuse me, gathered around him, uh, assuming that he's dead, <clears throat> looking like... Uh, uh, you know what? When they we're talking when they're stoned, we're talking about like boulders they're dropping on people. We're not like they're like throwing these little rocks at them. Uh, so he's pretty beat up, pretty bloody. And then he wow, he gets back up and he walks right back in the same city. Timothy is either one of those guys that witnessed that whole thing, uh, and, and a lot of writers assume that he was, or at least he heard it you know, right right from one of his friends or whatever family members, uh, uh, first person. Uh, had a tremendous impact upon him, uh, obviously, as it would uh, anybody. And so Paul considers him his son in the faith. 1 Corinthians 4.17, he says, he's my beloved son. Uh, in 1 Timothy 1.2, uh, my son, uh, my own son uh, in the faith. Uh, and uh, they certainly have a special relationship. Some would say Timothy becomes the son that Paul never never had. There's a mention of his, uh, his mother, uh, Eunice, his grandmother, uh, Lois. Uh, and uh, in their faith and uh, raising Timothy uh, to, uh, to know the Lord, uh, to trust God. Uh, and, uh, and so this young man is going to now join uh, the Apostle Paul. Referred to as, uh, uh, as a disciple at this point. He's referred to as having a good reputation uh, with uh, those in the city. And Paul sees that tremendous potential in Timothy and he is added to the ministry team. Uh, then the decision to circumcise uh, Timothy. Uh, and this uh, comes across as a little bit of a, seems to be a contradiction. There's an occasion in the church uh, uh, where, uh, they, where they want to circumcise uh, Titus, and then Paul refuses, uh, but he does Timothy. And it seems like there's a, a little bit of a double standard. Uh, again, what's going on here? They've just had this letter they've delivered saying, guys don't need to be circumcised. Why would he do it with Timothy, and we would say it is a cultural adaptation. <laughs> In other words, Timothy's mother is Jewish. He's Jewish. Uh, again, Old Testament uh, lineage, which was determined by the father, the father's name, and so forth. First century, as in Israel today, lineage is determined by the mother. Uh, and so Timothy is Jewish. Titus is not, uh, very simply. Uh, Timothy could have not been circumcised and probably had a, a great ministry with Paul, two Gentiles. But if he's willing to be circumcised, he can go right in the synagogue with the Apostle Paul, preach the gospel, talk about Jesus being the Messiah, open the scriptures and so forth, just like Paul. It just opens up a little more ministry. It was a little painful. It was a little inconvenient. But he was willing, willing to do it. 
But I mean, this is a guy that uh, uh, you know, presumably watches Paul beat to a pulp, and then he gets up and goes back in and continues on the ministry. And Paul says, this is going to help us out a lot. You'll have a greater ministry if you're willing to do this. It's like, absolutely. Let's just get it, let's get it over with. However God might, uh, might use me. Sometimes we have to expect a little pain in the process if we expect God to use us in a, in a greater way, in a greater capacity. Paul would explain it this way in 1 Corinthians 9.19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law as, with, uh, as without the law, uh, not being without a law towards God. Paul says, that, you know, I, I try to blend in here, but I'm not sinning. Uh, but under the law towards Christ. That I might win those who are without the law. To the weak, I became as weak. That I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men. That by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake. That I may be a partaker of it uh, with you. Cultural adaptation. is something that Paul did well. Early, early missionaries did well. In time, missionaries did horribly. Uh, in time, we know from... Uh, even the missionaries that came here to the islands. It was in an era of preaching the gospel, seeing people come to faith in Christ, and then somehow trying to westernize them uh, and, uh, rather than keep the gospel and the Bible in a, uh, in a cultural uh, context. The guy that kind of broke that all open was a guy named Hudson Taylor in the late 1800s. He sails from England. He goes to China. Uh, if you know his story, he's kind of a rebellious guy, but a fiery preacher. Uh, the, most of the ministry was taken, you know, Hong Kong, Shanghai, where there was basically other, uh, other uh, English and uh, British people living there. But he goes, no, I want to go inland and establishes the China Inland uh, Mission. In time, Hudson Taylor grows his hair <laughs> halfway down his back, wears it in a, in a pigtail, wears the little black uh, outfit that uh, all the other Chinese men uh, wore of his day and the little the little cap and all and so forth traded in his uh, his British uh, glasses for the big horned uh, round horn rim glasses that Chinese guy wore at the time and learned to uh, speak uh, uh, Chinese in several dialects uh, flawlessly so that by towards the end of his life people there thought he was Chinese uh, this Audi guy from uh, from Great Britain cultural adaptation he was criticized for it. People thought he was crazy. Missionary boards would not support Hudson Taylor. And he said, you know what? I'll trust the Lord. Where God guides, God provides. Now, we all think that came from Pastor Chuck. It came from men like Hudson Taylor <laughs> and others. Uh, he was a rebel in that way as well. Don't need your support. If this is God, God will take care of me. Quite the character. Cultural adaptation. And that's the way that missionaries uh, operate around the world uh, today. But it happens here uh, with Timothy uh, in circumcision, uh, in agreement so that they can reach more people with the gospel. Again, there's a dispute that sets Paul off, uh, that leads him on this journey. Uh, that's followed by a decision involving Timothy. We would say it's a relationship that's born out of pain. And in that sense, I'm talking about Paul's pain and Paul being stoned. But Timothy seen in the midst of it the grace of God uh, upon his life. He also now is willing to do endure some suffering uh, for the sake uh, of the gospel. And sometimes we just want to take the easy way out. Sometimes we limit what God wants to do in and through our lives. There might be somebody in your workplace throwing rocks at you. <laughs> but there's other people, uh, maybe a Timothy, that's watching you and saying, uh, how will you respond? to those stones, those insults, or whatever it might uh, might be. Uh, but again, uh, the Lord is saying to Paul, you need to obey me, uh, even when it's painful. It's a lesson that Timothy saw and learned. Uh, he's going to follow these men, end up having a, a great relationship, we'd say, born out of a heap of stones. Now the direction of the Holy Spirit that gets them uh, into Europe, verses 6 to 10. Uh, now, when they had gone through uh, Phygia in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia or Asia Minor. So they couldn't go south. Uh, and they had come to Mysia. They tried to go to uh, Bithynia. 
uh, but the Spirit would not permit them. So they couldn't go up towards the Black Sea. They couldn't go, they couldn't go north. Uh, uh, so they came to Troas. Uh, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision immediately, those are the change in the tents, we sought to go up to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel with them. So we just note that uh, uh, this is what we call a we section in the book of Acts. Uh, Luke has been writing, they, them, now all of a sudden it's we and it's us. Uh, Luke is in Troas, uh, Luke joins uh, uh, the group there. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and now Dr. Luke is with them. I mentioned again, circumstantially, the direction of the Holy Spirit prevented them from going to Asia or Asia Minor. They visit the churches they wanted to. They had established on the first journey. They're trying to get to new territory, and the Holy Spirit seems to be uh, not allowing that to happen. Uh, they're trying to get to where uh, present again. We're in uh, we're southern. They're trying to get to southern Turkey uh, today, where Ephesus is. But the door seemed closed at this point. He tries to go north to uh, Bithynia, uh, which again the uh, again uh, some pretty prosperous cities along the Black Sea. But again, the the Holy Spirit would not uh, uh, allow him to get there. <clears throat> Paul doesn't tell us. I mean, really, how how that really how that work? You know, I mean, this is a guy that is able to write. And the angel of the Lord stood by me and said, and, and tells them, you know, to not be discouraged. The ship they're on is going to going to fall apart, but you know, you're going to survive. So uh, God speaks to Paul through an angel. There's other times where he's very discouraged. and says, and the Lord stood by me and said, and the, the Lord said, just spoke to him uh, and, and encouraged him. Uh, but he doesn't mention uh, any of those kinds of things here. So I, I take this to mean that the Holy Spirit, circumstantially, just circumstantially, we wanted to go there, but I don't know, was it sickness? Was it illness? Is that why they found a doctor when they got to Troas, Dr. Luke? Uh, was it the roads were washed out? Was there a storm? Uh, it was just circumstances. We don't know what they were, but sometimes God does that. Uh, he directs us through circumstances, not always good ones. We like the good circumstances, but uh, doors are closing, and... Uh, uh, and things are, are, are not happening the way Paul uh, assumed that they, uh, they would have happened. Uh, and again, it's uh, comforting to me to know that uh, even for the apostles, uh, knowing God's will was not always a, a clear deal. It always makes me a little nervous when people are 100% sure. Well, I know the Lord told me and showed me. It's like, well, I don't really get that. I get a lot of, I kind of sense the Lord leading us. Let's, let's see what happens here, you know. And, uh, and that's what Paul's doing here. The Apostle Paul is doing here. He's not really sure where they're going. Uh, he just knows that wherever he tries to go, the Lord doesn't let him. Uh, and that could have been very discouraging. Now, does the gospel get to these places later? Uh, certainly. Peter writes to them in 1 Peter, uh, where he writes, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the uh, dispersion. So these are Jews living outside of uh, uh, Judea that are in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, the very places Paul wanted to take the gospel. The, the gospel gets there. Uh, but it could have been one of those times where Paul begins to do the what-ifs. And uh, again, these are the, the what-ifs are what keep us up at night. Um, what if we had taken John Mark? What if I had agreed with Barnabas? Maybe if we sell the Cyprus first, maybe the Lord would have let us then because he's not, he's not leaving us now. Uh, what if John Mark had never asked to go in the, far, this, this, the first place? What if I didn't always get sick? What if I were a little smarter? What if I just stayed home? You know, we can do, you know, when it seems like there is just, it's just not happening. We're trying to follow the Lord. We're trying to seek God's will. We're trying to do the right thing. We, we, we've had a sharp dispute <laughs> with, you know, someone that uh, we love, know, uh, and ad admire. Uh, some, some good things are happening, but man, we just can't seem to make any headway here uh, with the ministry and with the gospel. Paul would uh, later write this to Timothy. Maybe it's helpful to Timothy 2.1. What do you do in those situations? He says, uh, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What does Paul say to do in times like this? 
endure, suck it up, and keep going. That's what he says, what he says to do. Just keep going and, uh, and trust the Lord. Well, I'm not really sure. It doesn't matter. Just keep going. Just keep trusting the Lord. Uh, it had to be a confusing time uh, for the Apostle Paul. But again, I take great encouragement. The Apostle Paul just didn't always have it together, and he didn't always know for sure what God was doing and what God was directing, but he just kept kept going. And it was like God, again, was like, they were like walking into a geographic funnel that was just, but it didn't seem like that to them. It just seemed like a closed door, a closed door. Nothing's happening. Uh, but God was doing something actually uh, tremendously important. Uh, and then we have the direction of the Holy Spirit that include the vision uh, in the night. Look at verse 10 again. Now, after he'd seen the vision, immediately we uh, sought to go to Macedonia, concluding, that's the word I want to talk about for a moment, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. That word in the Greek is... Uh, uh, means to bring together. It's a, it's a verb, to knit together. Uh, in other words, Paul has a vision. Uh, it, it seems uh, pretty obvious. I get, uh, I don't know how he knew the guy was Macedonian, but somehow that's revealed in, in the vision. And it's, uh, and it's a cry for help. Um, I, uh, so there's an urgency to this. It's not just, hey, if you get a chance, stop by. You know, it's, it's this like call for, we're desperate here. We're desperate for the gospel. Uh, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so they, they uh, apparently talked about it. And we, and we concluded uh, that this would be the, uh, the right thing to do. So Dr. Luke, Paul, and company uh, with the vision knew that God uh, had a sense of urgency to get the gospel to, uh, to Europe. Not east uh, to Asia, uh, not north uh, to the Baltics or anything, uh, but directly to uh, Europe. Uh, and then thirdly, the direction of the Holy Spirit brought a new team member, as we've already mentioned. Luke joins them now. And uh, as we see in verse 10, and we sought to go to uh, Macedonia. So uh, Luke apparently is from Troas. He's there, uh, and uh, he becomes part of their ministry team. Uh, it changes from we to they in chapter 17, verse 1, which would suggest that he remains in Philippi. You get to Philippi. Uh, and uh, Luke's not with them. Obviously, he remains behind to uh, pastor the, the church that's been planted there. The next we section, we section picks up in chapter 20 in connection with Paul's trip to uh, Macedonia. But we just note from the language, uh, they've added a new uh, team member. And then lastly, we'd say the direction of the Holy Spirit, it was obeyed or followed by Paul as he remained flexible. Uh, it's not in the Bible, but we often say, Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken. Uh, and we ne got, we've got to remain flexible. Uh, you know, we, sometimes we just think we know that we know what the Lord's doing, and, and actually we don't. Uh, and he's got something else uh, uh, in mind uh, entirely. Uh, that's the case of other great missionaries. David Livingston had planned to go to China, but God sent him to Africa. William Carey planned to go to the South Pacific. God sent him to India. Adoram Judson, the first American missionary sent out, planned on going to India, uh, but ended up in Burma, uh, of uh, more contemporary uh, heroes of our faith. Marilyn Laszlo planned to go to Mexico, but ended up in Papua New Guinea. You know, we kind of—it's—it's it's good to seek the Lord and make plans, uh, but uh, we need to give the Holy Spirit permission to uh, change. Change direction, have, have a, a course correction as he uh, uh, guides uh, and directs us. Well, how did all of our missionaries get along in the end? Well, John Mark obviously gets on track with, uh, with Uncle Barney, uh, helping him out there and encouraging him uh, along the way. Uh, at the end of his life, Paul writes this in regards to him uh, in 2 Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me. This is when he's sitting in the uh, Mamertine prison waiting to get uh, executed uh, there in Rome. Only Luke is with me. Uh, get Mark uh, and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in the ministry. So Paul is uh, uh, nearing the end of his life facing uh, execution. He says, hey, bring, bring John Mark. I want to see that guy again. He's, he's helpful to me in the ministry. Um, uh, John Mark, uh, in, again, uh, ends up spending uh, so much time with, uh, with Peter <clears throat> that he ends up writing the gospel according to Mark. So this guy that appeared to be a failure in terms of ministry, Paul says, I'm not taking that guy with me again. 
the Vardas was says, you know, let's get, let's get this guy another shot. He ends up being one of the writers of, of, of the Bible. That's good, right? That's pretty good. That's pretty good for a guy that was a failure, or started out as a failure. This is encouraging. I just find this passage uh, extremely uh, encouraging here. Uh, in terms of how things turned out with Paul and Barnabas, there's only one other little line that gives us a little clue. It's in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, where Paul is writing there, and he's making a case for why missionaries should be supported. Now, he's kind of saying to himself, I don't really need it. I've never asked of anything. I just I made tents and did stuff. But, uh, you know, missionaries ought to be supported. He's kind of making that case. Uh, and he says, uh, uh, is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? So he kind of he takes Barnabas and says, uh, hey, here's Barnabas. He's a great missionary. He, he, he's like me. Uh, just, it's, just a little, it's just a little mention. Uh, but I, I think it speaks, uh, speaks volumes. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting here, here a little bit is that the timing of it. Again, we're in about 49 AD. First Corinthians is written early, early accounts would say 51 AD. So it takes a couple, a couple years later. So it's not like a, a quick, it's not like these guys are texting each other. You know, it's like, yeah, Kenny, I'm kind of sorry about that. You know, uh, who knows? Who knows if they ever had a face-to-face again uh, with each other? Uh, we don't know. Uh, but God in time kind of works, works this out. Uh, if you go for a later writing of, uh, of uh, 1 Corinthians, it's about seven years, it's about seven years later that, that Paul says this. You know, some of these big, sharp disputes are not settled uh, just overnight a lot of times. A lot of times it just takes a little time. Uh, but God still uses it uh, anyway. God directs uh, uh, us west when we think we should go north, and we don't know why. Uh, but he's, uh, he's got a reason. Uh, our point is to, uh, to yield. Uh, he promises uh, to uh, direct our paths. We, we kind of prefer a highway, you know, just like can we just like, you know, get there and just go for a ways and know that we're good, you know. Center of God's will, yeah. Spend time with the Lord, not for a few months, but on that highway, maybe I'm okay. No, he says, I'll, I'll give you like the, the next three steps. Check, check in with me at noon and we'll see how you're doing. It's just, it's just always just that, that light unto my path. Uh, again, he promises to, uh, to direct our paths. Uh, our part is to trust him with all of our hearts, the Proverbs says. Again, to keep moving, keep trusting, even when there's conflict, even when there's pain. God is watching and God uses uh, it all. Anyway, I hope that encourages you. If you have had a conflict in the past, you might have one in the future. Uh, if you ever have a sense that, man, I just, I'm just not quite sure I'm in the middle of God's will here or not. Uh, you know what? You may be right in the middle. And he just wants you to be really dependent upon him and keep trusting him. Again, we, we can't uh, overstate the importance of Paul making the leap into Europe with the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we'll uh, look at next week. It changes the course of the world. It changes the course of, of history. Uh, and it all starts with a big blowout with his best friend. It's just, uh, uh, you can't make this stuff up. It's, uh, I just find it fascinating. And it kind of brings these guys down to a reality that uh, once again says that, you know, maybe God can use me after all. You know, he used these knuckleheads, you know. Uh, I think he's kind of looking for anybody. You know, sometimes we, we say that uh, uh, God is not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. I think that's true in a sense, but I think a better truism is uh, God's not looking for ability. He's looking for availability with humility. A lot of people are available, but God's not using them. They probably would prefer not to. Uh, But if we'll humble ourselves and make ourselves available, it's amazing how he will use us and guide us and direct us and bring up Barnabas into our lives when... uh, we think we're the, the big failures. John Mark turned out pretty good, didn't he? Paul didn't want to have anything to do with him. I, I just find that fascinating. Uh, God bless the Barnabases of this world. And maybe he wants us to be one. You know, I was, uh, you know, when I'm praying for people, I'm always, uh, you know, the missionaries, people I haven't seen in a while, family members I don't see often. I'm always kind of praying that, uh, uh, that they'll have, uh, you know, the, 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 the Pauls to disciple them uh, a Timothy that they can disciple and a Barnabas to encourage them. I don't know where you flow in that chart, but uh, it's an easy thing to, to encourage somebody. 
and I think we all need it. Thank you, Lord of heaven, King of glory, throned in majesty, you are holy, you are holy.
Thank you. 